All right. We're going to dive into it. There's a lot to talk about today. It's funny, like I was messaging a couple people um, in the ecosystem. I got to say in, in kind of like the Hedera community, Hedera ecosystem, people are so busy right now. Um, and that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the general theme that I've been noticing and I don't, I don't mind it at all. Um, so that also means there's a lot of news and because this isn't a situation where I've got a guest this week, actually, it's kind of weird. Like it, when this show started, I had no idea we'd have guests, but now it's weird if there's not a guest, but it actually works out this week because we have some major stories. Um, and I'm getting the feeling that that ripple SEC ruling, um, has had an effect on a lot of things. We'll, we'll kind of dive into it, but I mean, I don't know whether they say I'm live on Twitter spaces or live on X. Cause I guess just today it was announced by Elon Musk that the, you know, the Twitter app, the Twitter platform, we're getting rid of the bird. As we know, kind of like even since the, you know, before the PayPal days, you know, X.com, um, Elon Musk kind of wanted to create this everything app. So literally the Twitter logo is going to be swapped out. The apps are going to be swapped out. I mean, a lot of people are talking about it. So, you know, I don't know whether they say, hey, I'm live on Twitter spaces or I'm live on X. I don't know. We'll see when that day comes. So for now, live on Twitter spaces. Let's see what's going on here. Let's see what the current H bar price is. <clears throat> H bar price. It is Sunday, July 23rd, and it's 5.3 cents US. So there was a, actually an interesting, um, where was that? I tweeted that recently. Let me see if I can find that. There was a really interesting um, tidbit that I saw. I can't remember exactly where I saw it. But it really was an eye opener, just kind of when you think about the short term and in the long term, when you know you're invested in Hedera, H bar. Um, gosh, let me see if I can find it here. It's worth it. Trust me, it's worth it. I'm almost there. I think I, I think I see it. Or wait, oh, it's so good. I got to find it. If I can't find it in two seconds, I'm not going to bother with it. Nah. It was really good. Anyways, um, we're at the same price that HBAR was at um, last January 2021 at the same price. And the market cap at that time was just about $500 million. Now the market cap's $1.8 billion. So there is definitely growth. Um, and it's pretty evident in a lot of ways, especially with the stories this week. Um, also, too, talking about, you know, talking about some numbers. I mean, Shane... Um, CEO of the HBAR Foundation on Twitter, kind of pushing back on a lot of criticism from the community just in regards to transparency and stuff like that. And I mean, it definitely seems like a contentious debate slash discussion. I don't know if there's really agreement, but I mean, I've been talking about this on the show for a long time. You know, I think that the closer people can get together, in the Hedera community and also kind of the enterprise governing council, H bar foundation kind of world, the better it's not pretty. It turns out, but I think that conversations are happening and, and from that, like a lot of the different points and counterpoints reveal so much interesting information about the network, how it functions, how the H bar foundation functions, all those different types of things. So that's been really interesting to, uh, to watch unfold. So we'll talk about that. Um, while we wait for uh, folks to join, let's take a quick look at the mega thread, the H bar news mega thread on Twitter and see what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to be talking about the uh, stablecoin remittance proof of concept um, by Shinhan Bank governing council member and quote, the largest financial institution in Taiwan. So we'll talk a little bit about that, speculate a little bit. Um, King Solomon had a couple cool breadcrumbs regarding that too. Um, House Committee on Agriculture pushing forward a crypto bill that'll have more positive ramifications. Um, Hedera is involved with that kind of in some capacity. EM Tech got some CBDC stuff. 
MetaMask and Hedera um, are going to have some further integration thanks to some announcements uh, for dev tooling. That's huge. That's going to be huge for the network, seeing that uh, progress in that direction. Um, we got some interesting data and statistics from Brady at Swirls. Coupon updates. Um, Atma.io has received another 26 million HBAR in additional grant funding from the HBAR Foundation. Um, so HBAR Foundation really top of mind for me this uh, this episode, it seems. Um, what else we got going on? Jeez, we got a lot. Saucer Swap actually shared a really, um, I'd say, shocking statistic about the AMM uh, architecture of the version one protocol versus the CLMM version two of their protocol. Some, it, it's, it's big stuff. Music NFTs are, are uh, continuing to trend. Ethereum is having trouble scaling. Uh, what else we were we talking about? Oh, King Solomon found another breadcrumb. Um, and I mean, worth mentioning, but I mean also kind of like weird. The, the, the network just hit 15 billion transactions, right? Think about that. That's a billion transactions every 10 days. And I, you know, like, let's go on Hedera, um, the website everyone uses, HederaTXNS.com. Um, I know Archaia also has um, a transaction counter. They show some other information as well. But we're, we're going along at 1,400 TPS, um, and we're already at 15.18 billion. So it's like we've already done 180 million transactions since um, that news came out. So it's it's kind of crazy. I don't even think Hedera like registered that it happened. Their tweet was kind of like, oh, whoops, we missed it. So huge milestones like that just flying by. Um, just ref like we we were doing, we were averaging like 20, 30 transactions in January, right? Crazy stuff. And with that, good evening from Ottawa, Canada, everyone. My name is Brandon Davenport, a.k.a. It's Brandon D. It is... Sunday, July 23rd, and you're listening to Hashgraph News and Rumors, episode 84, Competitive Differentiation. So it, that's that title is there for a reason. I'll, I'll explain later. Um, it's a weekly show where we cover the top stories related to Hedera, HBAR, and everything in between. Listen live on Twitter Spaces every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other platforms to hear past episodes. Get all the info you need about the show at itsbrandond.com slash hbar. For folks listening live now, check out the News and Rumors mega thread up on the Jumbotron as we dive into each story. Also, take a moment to share this Twitter spaces with your friends. And if you've got some interesting news people should know about, click the comment button at the bottom right. Maybe share a photo of where you're listening from. I mean, I've had people DM me photos like, cheers, you know, ch hanging out outside listening to the show. So you like post those in the comments if you're going to. And for folks listening to the recording, leave a comment, break down your thoughts on what we're talking about today. Let's keep the conversation going. Um, yeah, so let's just dive into it. I mean, we got a lot to talk about. So on the top of everyone's mind in the ecosystem, I think is this. Um, stable coin remittance proof of concept test from Shahan Bank. Let me open up my my notes here. I've I've taken a lot of notes for this episode. Um, so people might remember back in um, November 2021, there was an article on the Hedera website titled "Shahan Bank to Conduct Stable Coin International Remittance Proof of Concept on Hedera Network." in partnership with major multinational bank. So we had this exact same situation happen two years ago, right? And it turned out that that proof of concept remittance test that Shenhan Bank did in November 2021 was with Standard Bank. So we had two governing council members, Shenhan Bank and Standard Bank, doing a remittance test between their respective banks. And it was exciting because um, and remember this back in 2021, you had two major banks of two different countries leveraging stable coins minted on Hedera to do remittance. And at the time, there was a quote that Christian Hasker, who is the head of marketing at Swirls Labs, um, Christian Hasker said, quote, it's criminal how much it costs to send money internationally and how long it takes to settle. It's usually a tax on people who can least afford it. 
sending money to their relatives. Stoked that governing council members are piloting solutions on Hedera. So this was, again, 2021 winter, and we're just seeing the first major financial institutions doing stablecoin remittance payments, proof of concepts on Hedera. And it turned out to be two governing council members, and it was a big success. And I think it did generate a lot of noise. Um, and I think, yeah, it was at the time when we were starting to see that crazy price action on HBAR. And here we are. Just a few days ago, Shinhead Bank announced that they've done this again. They've done another stablecoin remittance proof of concept test with SCB Tech X Company Limited. That's a, quite the name there. It is a digitally native industry leading platform as a service business that provides innovative banking services and non banking services to commercial institutions and consumers throughout Southeast Asia. Um, so, yeah, obviously, some kind of technology company helping banks, you know, get done what they need done with new technologies. And of course, Shinhan Bank, governing council member, is a leading commercial bank in South Korea um, with. Uh, 664 trillion won in assets and provides a full range of banking services to 27 million customers, right? So Shinhan Bank is huge and their governing council member on Adira. And this is their kind of second ride around with this proof of concept. But then we have kind of two really interesting aspects to this remittance test because if Shinhan Bank, and, and also to a quick refresher, like the whole exciting thing about this is if you've ever gone to your bank, Right. I'm in I'm in Ottawa, Canada, right? So let's say I wanted to send money to someone in the US, right? So from Canadian dollar to US dollar. Or maybe let's choose somewhere um, you know, way different. Like if, you know, I needed to send uh someone in, you know, uh, you know, England a pound, right? So basically, if I was gonna be sending, let's say a thousand dollars in Canada, go to the bank, that process to get that money that thousand Canadian dollars to someone right in England is going to take days. It could cost, you know, maybe like $30 and you don't really know what happens in between. Right. And there's all sorts of issues that could happen along the way. So when those, and also too, it's not just one bank sending it to another bank. It's like playing hopscotch between all sorts of different uh, foreign exchange places and all sorts of stuff. It's crazy. And it takes, it takes a while. It takes forever. And what people expect in this modern day, and with these remittance tests running on Hedera, basically you can take, when I go to my bank in Canada and I, and I, you know, submit my money that I'd like to, um, send as, you know, a uh, remittance over to another bank in England, it would take my Canadian dollar, convert it to write some kind of stable coin for, for the Canadian dollar, basically one that's minted on Hedera. And it would look the same in my bank app on my phone, right? And then it would just swap that for the, you know, tokenized stablecoin version of the pound over there. And then it would be in their banking app. So you could also argue that it could go further within the banking system of the actual currency in your wallet as a tokenized asset on Tadera. But that's aside from the point. Basically, that's that's the vibe of it. That's why it's exciting. And it's and it's cool because again, it happened in 2021 and here it's happening here. So what are the two really interesting things about this? Well, the first interesting thing is there's the question of, well, who's the other bank, right? If, if Shanahan Bank is there, they have kind of this technology partner. Who's, who's the other bank sending money back and forth? And so that was kind of a mystery. It was basically in the press release, it said, quote, largest finance, financial institution in Taiwan. So I sent out a tweet. I, I was talking with chat GPT with a few plugins and I was narrowing down who are the largest financial institutions in Taiwan. And so I narrowed it down to the two. One is Taiwan Financial Holdings Group. This is a state-owned corporation that is the parent holding company of the Bank of Taiwan, Bank Taiwan Securities, and Bank Taiwan Life Insurance. Founded in 2007 and commenced in 2008, it is the largest financial institution in Taiwan. As of 2008, it was the 18th largest financial institution in Asia and the 89th largest in the world, with assets of net total 5.4 billion and net worth of 373 billion. So, massive financial institution, right? Number two is 
CTBC Financial Holding, formerly known as China Trust Financial Holding Company Limited. This holding company is principally engaged in the finance industry through its eight major subsidiaries. Its services are classified into eight categories, banking, including corporate banking, consumer finance and retail banking, securities, bill and bond insurance, brokerage, venture capital, asset management, security service, and lottery. As of 2015, it had assets worth $115 billion. So these large financial institutions, it starts to get you thinking, who is on the other side of this stablecoin remittance proof of concept? And so it's a, obviously a, a mystery institution. I've just put out two suggestions just based off of the information we know, but it's really just purely speculative, but would be exciting. Um, and I fully expect this other institution to be revealed. Um, but that brings us kind of the title of, to the spaces this week. And it, we have to go back a little bit. There was, and, and again, I just want to pause here, right? We're talking about um, this major news that came out that's like a huge real world use case that's in its you know third year of testing, second major test. This is a big deal, but there's a mystery counterparty. And why in this case would this other bank want to remain a mystery? And as I was looking through this news, I was catching up on some Twitter spaces from uh, the last week or so. And there was a Twitter Spaces on July 11th, and it was with um, Shane, CEO of HBAR Foundation, um, and Simon ba Baxis from Google, uh, who's the go-to-market and business development um, head there. And basically, I just wanted to pull a little tidbit that Shane said there that kind of ties into this Shinham Bank stuff. Um Shay was asked a question asked a question about testnet activity on Hedera, right? We always talk about, you know, the activity happening on testnet will one day move to mainnet. When is that going to happen? And what is that testnet activity? And what he said is enterprises want to stay secret because they consider this a quote competitive differentiation. We do expect multiple thousands of sustained TPS over the next couple of years. We need more diversified types of transactions. They've been focusing on HTS for revenue. So that's from the HBAR Foundation. So I want to just kind of hit that again, right? Enterprises want to stay secret because they consider this and this meeting, Hedera, right? They consider Hedera a, quote, competitive differentiation. So a competitive differentiation is how a company's product or service is distinct from what its competitors offer. So basically what's going on here is, and what it seems is, the reason this other bank in this massive bombshell story about Hedera, the reason this other bank wants to remain unknown is because they consider the use of this technology as an unfair advantage in their industry, in the banking industry, right? So if Hedera is considered this kind of unfair advantage, then in these early days, it's, yeah, it can probably be expected that a lot of these enterprise use cases are going to remain secret until going public, right? Because it sends a lot of signals. And, you know, I think that we'll find out who this other bank was, but it'll depend on when they're, when they kind of feel confident that their um, any kind of risk is mitigated from delivery of their solution, right? The risk being competitors kind of going, "Hey, this this looks fantastic. I'm going to do this too." They need a, they need enough headway. So that's just a really interesting component of that. Um, and some other points about this uh, Shanham Bank stuff is. They've tapped into foreign, it seems they've tapped into foreign uh, exchange rates. So within the smart contract EVM compatible um, infrastructure they've created, um, it does appear as though actual FX quotes, right, from the foreign exchange markets are integrated into this somehow, which is fascinating. Um, also, too, a few interesting points. Um, Rob Allen commented just on the H Bar Bulls recent show on Friday. He had a segment with Rob Allen, um, and he commented, "The decentralized architecture they've used is super exciting." Um, and I thought that was interesting because obviously Rob has knowledge about you know 
who's involved in this. Um, he shared that Sabrina and Alice at the HBAR Foundation have been driving the initiative, and Greg Scullard and his team at Swirls Labs developed the tool that was utilized for this um, stablecoin remittance proof of concept test with Shithead Bank. And, you know, that's it, it does feel really crazy that the two major banks are doing this. Like, that's well, now I guess three, right? Because Shanahan Bank did it with Standard Bank before. So three major banks in different parts of the world um, have done these massive um, stablecoin remittance, you know, proof of concept tests on Hedera. That's wild. Um, so the pilot achieved real-time set, set, uh, settlement and real-time foreign exchange rates integration across the Thai bot and uh, new Taiwan dollar and South Korean one in a test environment. The proof of concept is EVM compatible, meaning that any EVM based stablecoin issuers can participate using the framework going forward. The proof of concept is a continuation of Shinham Bank's previous work that started in 2021 when they partnered with Standard Bank on stablecoin international remittances. The successful completion of this uh, proof of concept marks a significant milestone in the quest for efficient, low cost cross border payments. Um, Chief of the blockchain division at Shinham Bank's highlighted the importance of leveraging blockchain technology for cross-border payments, stating that stablecoins offer a low, fast, and reliable way to transfer value across borders. Um, so this is, you know, it, it does seem like there's some stuff moving with force, right? Especially in the financial sector. Now, um, I think that there's one thing in my mind about this, which is the timing, right? When you think about the Ripple case and the kind of elation that there's been in the crypto ecosystem. Um, and also too, like in, in, you know, bringing up Christian Hasker again, in interviews years ago, he would explicitly state that, you know, Hedera can't do the same type of marketing as other networks regarding, you know, stake your coin, get a return, run a node, get a return. Hedera really was waiting on regulatory clarity. And he, he said, like, once we have that, we can do more um, things like that, you know? And I think that the Ripple case is one step closer to that. And the governing council and use cases on Hedera and kind of the Web3 industry in general, it's, it's, it's definitely felt like a logjam was removed. It feels like it's back to business as usual. And... I, you know, it's just worth pointing out that, you know, just you could argue just over a week or days after the Ripple ruling, a decision was made to announce this stablecoin remittance proof of concept test using Hedera. Um, probably, you know, very well could be a coincidence, but just kind of worth pointing out. I think that, you know, if we do start to see um, other, you know, stories like this and, and, and uh, bombshell announcements like this, then it could definitely mean that that uh, ruling in that, in that case had a bigger effect than maybe I imagined. Um, I brought up the H bar bull and he had a really great uh, episode on Friday. I just wanted to go through a couple points of that. Um, he does a shark bite segment with Rob Allen. Rob Allen's great. I mean, if you talk about someone who started as just an H bar investor in group chats, and then ended up on the governing council, then at the H Bar Foundation, then at the Hashgraph Association, and kind of like a, a kind of true grassroots um, journey through the ecosystem to the top. You know, it's Rob Allen, and he shared some good insights. Um, and you, this is actually kind of cool. Like if you go on the H Bar Bulls videos, you can ask Rob Allen, and you know questions in the YouTube comments. So I might do that. Like if you literally want to ask someone who's kind of on the inside, some questions as best he can answer, it's, you know, it's worth pointing out. So he was asked a question about the hash graph association funding and transparency. Um, so obviously a big, you know, topic of conversation we'll touch on a little later is the H bar foundation, how their grant money has been distributed and kind of like what what's the what's the transparency around that so obviously that question is a product of those ongoing debates and rob allen said a lot of people forget the hashgraph association which is based in switzerland which is a different kind of accelerator in the ecosystem often compared to the hbar foundation 
Um, the Hashgraph Association is actually older than the HBAR Foundation, and it's not a grant-giving foundation. <clears throat> they actually receive grants directly from the Hedera Governing Council based on KPIs, deal flow, and scale. They are an accelerator and program management framework. So again, it kind of begs the question, okay, we have another um, accelerator kind of incubator body in the ecosystem that's being given grant money. What's the transparency around that? Yada, yada, yada. Um, so there is, yeah, there's a few elements to this where it just kind of raises more questions, but I mean, you know, it is what it is as long as the conversations keep happening. Um, he was asked a question as well. Our FPOS, right? FPOS is a, uh, you know, governing council member. And Miko, Miko is kind of have has been like a development partner of Hedera for a long time. We've worked on, you know, all sorts of different use cases. Are they still working with the Queensland government using Hedera on a digital identity pilot? If so, what stage is the pilot? What was involved in the pilot? And then Rob Allen said, to his knowledge, they are not in a pilot, but offer some interesting points regarding Miko and Connect ID. So if people remember Connect ID, that's like a use case. It's like one of the original decentralized identity use cases on Adira. Rob Allen says the Connect ID business was using a framework that is, quote, federalized and is looking to move to a decentralized framework. And I'm thinking, well, maybe that might be a similar, you know, structure to Hedera, right? Could we see an organization kind of borrow from Hedera more directly to transition from one structure to a decentralized structure? That'd be interesting. Um, and that process is underway. Connect ID is a business that has launched. It services the Australian user base and is supported by the banks now post merger of FPOS with the res with the rest of the payments industry, right? Because Connect ID is kind of an, in an initiative by FPOS, right? So that's how kind of Rob Allen was connected with that because Rob Allen was previously at FPOS. That's how he um, kind of had a seat at the governing council, um, and they have pilot projects ongoing and did some of the first Hedera decentralized identity products. Also, Rob Allen pointed out, like, listen, some of these pilots, people see the pilot and then maybe there's not a major um, product or service announced, right, by the company. And then people go, oh, that pilot was for no reason. And it's not true. It's like he says the, the point of the pilot is to illustrate, you know, how this thing actually works. It's like a pilot for television, right? You film the first episode and you shop it around and someone decides to make the rest of the series. So it's like, if you can prove that these things drive value, then you can make something happen. So he's kind of like, as long as these pilots keep happening, it just builds on the case for Web3 being used for real world problems. Um, so, I mean, the other thing too is, uh, Rob Allen was asked a question about Web3 social media platforms, um, especially as we've seen, you know, like, you know, Twitter being changed into X, you know, and we've we have to launch a threads. Um, so it, the, the the social media space and also, too, we have like Web3 social platforms like Blue Sky and um, Megalodon. And, and then we also have, um, you know, Galaxy on Hedera and, you know, other different social media applications. So Rob Allen was asked, like, what's going on with the space? How does Hedera fit into the social media landscape? And actually I talked about this exact topic last week with Solo, um, CEO of Galaxy. So go back and listen to episode 83 if you want to hear an interview. He shared some interesting tidbits about Galaxy regarding Hedera in particular. So if you're interested about how Galaxy is using Hedera, go back and listen to last week. Uh, but Rob Allen says, Lehman's original vision is about carving out a piece of the internet for yourself and connecting to each other. Shared worlds. Closing and opening hash graphs. Right? So there's going to be many hash graphs out there. They'll all connect with each other. Hedera is the best network to build social networking apps. So kind of, again, saying like, sure, there are other networks that specialize in this space. In particular, you know, Jack Dorsey's leverage is the, you know, Bitcoin Lightning Network for payments or zaps or something as he calls them. But Rob Allen basically makes the case saying, you know, Hedera is arguably better for social media than the networks that specialize in it. And furthermore, it can do all sorts of other things as we know. So Rob Allen kind of really bringing the weight when it comes to Hedera. So I appreciate that. 
Also, we got some new Rack DAO insights. I was talking about Rack DAO last week, and I have to admit, like I didn't really understand the use case enough. And basically, here's the down low. Again, this is from the HBAR Bulls recently episode um, from Friday. Go watch it. But I just want it, it's worth just bringing up and kind of summarizing this because I think it's important. Um, so this comes from James Bernard, who's the CCO of Rack DAO. Their da and this is interesting. The DAO stands for Digital Asset Oasis. So, okay, so not digital or not decentralized autonomous organization. So we'll figure it out. Um, they're building a Web3 ecosystem, the first free zone in the world dedicated to Web3. And they're partnered with the HBAR Foundation. They want to capture every vertical of the Web3 space. And they're building infrastructure for companies to start up and scale up. So remember, so this is the UAE and they are basically wanting to create like this epicenter of web three. And we're seeing a lot of these companies kind of, you know, lots of people that I speak with, you know, or calling from Dubai and like, there's a lot of activity out there. So um, it's a very interesting spot. They say they have quote, a few tricks up their sleeves, right? AKA probably boatloads of money, which is great. I mean, there's probably going to be a tidal wave of money flowing into the Web3 ecosystem as the years roll on, just with, you know, as, as the regulatory landscape clears up, all those different types of things. So once when, you know, somebody like this working at a scale like this says they have a few tricks up their sleeve, probably it's just money. Um, they want to be a venture studio, incubator, accelerator on steroids. Um, again, AKA we have a lot of money. That's what it sounds like to me. Um, there's many new announcements to come from Rack Dow, so I'm gonna watch this. I mean, it, it's big. I mean, again, I think that a lot of things that happen in crypto outside of, you know, the U.S. and Canada, I think that a lot of that kind of doesn't make it to my desk. So I've got to, you know, I'm really trying to be more global with kind of the news that I'm getting. It's a lot to keep up with, guys. Like this, like the the Hedera ecosystem, just kind of that Hashgraph enthusiast scope is growing so big. Like it's. It's crazy. I'm actually, th I mean, if anybody out there, if anyone's interested in helping me with kind of research aspects of the show, hit me up. Anyone really, really great at research and stuff like that. I don't know. I've, I'm thinking of ways to scale the show. We we have kind of H bar contributions coming into the show. It's growing. Like things are things are going to change. Things are going to get big. So I mean, I'm prepping for that, but I'm doing my best. Also. A lot of the companies they're partnered with are also already partnered with Hedera and the HBAR Foundation. So what that tells me, again, is a lot of these companies and startups that are getting rolling want to expand into those areas. Um, they started licensing, licensing companies a few weeks back. Um, also curious, they're also looking for developers that are interested in building blocks for business. So it also sounds like a resource for someone who just has an idea or is a developer and has a kind of minimum viable product that wants to build a business around that. Sounds like this could be a resource for that, interestingly enough. Um, they are going to support other networks besides Hedera too. So that is a common theme we're going to see going forward. I mean, as the bull market starts to approach, a lot of these major players are going to start casting wider nets. So just prepare for the fact that, you know, not everyone's going to put everything in one basket. There's going to be it, it, the very beginning of the bull market is going to be kind of a rising tide raises all ships. So we're going to see lots of pivots and stuff like that. Um, and most interesting thing to me was RackDAO currently offers the ability to do like LLCs and all those different types of company structures and incorporating, um, pathways with you know these startups that they incubate but they're also going to start offering the ability to do it down right which is important so that's also interesting um something else from the um h bar bulls show was saucer swap peter from saucer swap was sharing some really interesting tidbits um basically he broke down what saucer swap version 2 is really about and we chatted about this last week uh, but I wanted to just bring up a couple of these key insights here. So saucer swap version one is based on Uniswap version two. All right. So there's the first bit, which is a constant product AMM and saucer swap version two is based on Uniswap version three, which is a concentrated liquidity market maker. 
Big difference is the ability for liquidity providers to choose the price ranges that their capital is allocated to. Liquidity can be concentrated, right, price impact, up to 4,000 times more capital efficient. So basically, in the liquidity pool that you're providing liquidity to, you can kind of choose the price range that you're doing it at. So liquidity can be much deeper and you're not going to see a crazy price impact. Um, and just, I mean, real quick on this, he sh uh, Saucer Swap shared um, a tweet that kind of outlined this. And, and it was basically just a screenshot that showed with their version one protocol, the estimated fees earned um, by in 24 hours um, with uh, current setup would in fees would be 38 cents versus their version two, which would be $8.85 in 24 hours. So the capital efficiency and fee earning potential is huge. Um, and that's kind of why they pivoted their tokenomics and allow, and announced the uh, version two protocol. Uh, so that was really interesting. Um, but what else is going on here? Let's get through some other of some other stories. I mean, that shit on bank uh, stable coin remittance test news was just so huge. Um, we had to really take a deep dive on that. Um, man, I want to get to to something really, really fun here because I mean, there's some heavy news here. Um, okay, so music on Hedera is something. I mean, I'm a drummer. I'm a musician. I have a music NFT coming. Um, through my creative firm, Dirksen and Davenport Incorporated, we're doing music NFT because half of the artwork that you consume out there in the real world, IRL, is stuff you see. The other half is stuff you hear generally, right? If you want to break it down. And in what the Web3 space, I mean, 95% or more is stuff that you see. And music is such a different artistic medium that brings all of its own sets of challenges. And on Hedera, we're trying to grow um, the music ecosystem because I think it has so much potential, but it, we need things like um, certain standards. We also need artists to mint music. So the liftoff in partnership with Vicente, um, who is uh, like a pillar community member in the Hedera NFT ecosystem, um, on August 3rd, there's a live from LA with Grammy nominated um, an incredibly talented artist named Nikki Flores or Flores. And basically what this is, is the kind of mainstream indie artists out there are really interested in web three technology and blockchain and Ethereum. Just, I don't think ticks enough boxes for them. These aren't people that are steeped in the NFT culture and communities. They're just looking to find a better way to connect with their fans. So Hedera is really aligned for that. And we're, we have Grammy nominated artists. They're going to be doing live from LA performances um, in the Hedera community. So August 3rd, check it out. The liftoff. Um, I went to a show in the liftoff. It's a metaverse venue. It's awesome. Um, it's a vibe guys. I dig it. So check that out. Hashtag hello music. That is the, calling card of what we're trying to do here um other big news so there's kind of like this really og use case em tech and em tech is focused on cbdc's now i know that there's a lot of contentious conversations and debate around cbdc's but a lot of the times when people talk about cbdc's they're not talking about um reinventing banking systems like in America and stuff, what they're talking about is about building new financial infrastructure in places where people don't have access to banking to begin with. Um, so EM tech is focused in a lot of these different um, geographical locations and, and uh, working with these various governments and organizations. We've had, we've talked about um, their use cases um, many times and updates from them on the show. And this most recent one, um, they've announced their CBDC innovation kit. And you could, you could really argue this is a major story in the Hedera ecosystem right now, because again, despite what your opinion is on CBDCs, again, we're not necessarily talking about replacing the financial system in America. We're talking about places where they literally, where people just don't have access to banking to begin with. So they're trying to build new infrastructure in a more accessible, transparent, decentralized way. You know, I'm, I, I'm not against it. I'm excited to see how it unfolds. So for folks unfamiliar, EM Tech is a software company and provider of modern 
central banking infrastructure has announced the public release of its central bank digital currency innovation kit for fintechs and financial service providers. The CBDC innovation kit is designed to help these entities test new fintech solutions and businesses and business models with central bank digital currency. The kit provides a new set of tools for exploring possibilities of a digital cash infrastructure consisting or sorry, considering the over 10 trillion of paper cash in circulation and the fact that over 93% of central banks are exploring and piloting CBDCs, um, the kit uses a public distributed ledger technology, brackets Hedera Hashgraph. We actually saw EM Tech tweet out in response to someone asking if it used Hedera. They said, quote, you're right. Our CBDC is natively issued on Hedera using HTS and HTS, HCS for consensus. So multiple confirmations that they are using Hedera. Exciting. Um, so it shows Hedera as a later one protocol, an ERC-20 standard for tokenization. It includes a simulated token called, quote, Beyond Cash for innovation projects. The CBDC Innovation Kit offers developer-friendly APIs for a, quote, bring-your-own-app ecosystem model and comes with pre-built dashboards for users to run their tests. EM Tech's goals is to enable central banks to safely deploy their CBDC as a digital cash infrastructure, driving inclusion, interoperability, and resilience by embracing the growing fintech ecosystems, despite the broad inclusion of CBDC in central bank strategies, the impact of CBDC on economic and financial systems remains relatively unknown. And basically that's the whole point of this is if they can launch this innovation kit, basically now these governments and these use cases can actually just start seeing what it looks like when things are actually running. That's a huge step of understanding the whole CBDC problem is what does it look like when it runs? Can the country actually function on a fully Web3 CBDC network? So that's going to be interesting to watch. Um, more info can be found on their website. Check it out. It's a vibe. Um, and I mean, shout out to uh, Carmel Cadet and the team. I'm hoping to have her on the show next week, actually. So we'll see what we can do. Maybe we can learn a little more about what EM Tech is doing. Uh, what else we got going on? We got, uh, oh, this is really interesting. So Brady from Swirls shared a couple really interesting tidbits in regards to the decentralization of Hedera. And I know that there's been a lot of pushback from Hedera and, and uh, Mance, uh, co-founder of Hedera in particular, Mance Harmon, um, basically, you know, saying that you know, not to quote him, but saying something to the effect of it's a fallacy to assume that Bitcoin and Ethereum are more decentralized than Hedera. Um, you know, pointing out the fact that not all nodes actually participate in governance and that there can be an argument made that a small handful of um, people control those networks, et cetera. That, I mean, that's the argument from the Hedera side. There's been many counter arguments. But Brady from Swirled shares um, some kind of hard stats about the nodes and the the different ways that they're distributed. So they, he shows some data um, by, you know, distribution by country, by continent. Um, he also shows uh, validator distribution by hosting providers. So like, um, you know, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud. Um, then you got Microsoft Azure, um, like all IBM cloud. So also all of these different nodes are hosted by different providers. So it's not like all the nodes are on AWS, which is really interesting as well. Um, these are the Hedera nodes. Also, um, the most interesting tidbit was who asked this question to Brady to give credit? Oh, Sivo. So Parabolic H bar on Twitter asked Brady, what is Hedera's Nakamoto coefficient? So a Nakamoto coefficient is basically the minimum number of nodes that would need to agree to prevent a blockchain from operating properly. So basically how many of the Hedera nodes would need to conspire to harm the network? And according to Brady, the Nakamoto coefficient of Hedera is nine. So nine governing council members would have to conspire to damage the network. Um, now, put up against other networks, 
it's not bad, right? And the data around the Nakamoto coefficient for a lot of networks, I imagine, is hard to determine. I don't know. But according to Brady at Swirls, Hedera's is nine. So that's an interesting... Yeah, definitely check that out. Um, some interesting uh, standouts is like 38% of the validators are in Australia, um, which is interesting um, just in regards to country. And um, basically all of the validator nodes are on separate hosting providers. It looks like only AWS and Microsoft Azure host more than one node, which is really interesting. So it's pretty decentralized. I mean, uh, could be more decentralized, but you know, Hey, here we are. Um, I want to say just a quick moment. Um, just before we dive into the rest of the news here, Huge shout out to everyone supporting the show. I mean, the Hashgraph Enthusiast News and Rumors show averages about 500 listeners every week on Twitter Spaces and, or I guess X soon, and hundreds more on podcast platforms. Um, and over the years, I've covered every major Adair news event, unpacked almost every juicy rumor, and hosted countless in-depth discussions with important figures in the Hedera ecosystem. And I've been able to broadcast all of it live with you guys. So if you'd like to support the show, um, consider making um, an HBAR donation. Um, and like many folks in the ecosystem have been doing, I'm just going to share the info to the top here. Um, yeah, I mean, the best is just getting like these funny memos and stuff people will leave. Uh, and I mean, a few bucks even adds up. So I've... We've got, I mean, we've got thousands of H bar that's been donated or, you know, contributed to the show, which is amazing. Um, I've got the equipment I need to purchase. Um, I've redone a couple ways that I organized the show. I mean, an important thing I had to do um, just post wedding was like um, change the way that I prepare stories, the way that I leverage AI, all these different types of things for the show to put things together. I'm trying to find ways to make the process more streamlined and like ways to, um, increase kind of the the value of the show that people get because i mean people rely on the show um for their news every week so hopefully very soon gonna be sounding a lot better um gonna be getting a new mixing console i've narrowed down i think which one i need to get all the wires all the hookups all the setups so i'm gonna probably be taking some time to you know order that stuff set it up um and i mean that's what it's about um you can send a contribution to enthusiast.hbar using your hedera wallet Again, fun memos, appreciated. The show's full Hedera address is in the podcast show notes, YouTube description, and in the mega thread up in the Jumbotron for folks listening live. Get all the info you need about the show at itsbrandandd.com slash hbar. Also, leave a rating and review for the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Leave a comment on YouTube. This actually helps the show. I mean, the Hedera community is still pretty small, but I mean, hopefully this helps us grow. Brought to you by listeners like you. So coupons, uh, it wouldn't be a show without me talking about coupons. And we actually do have legitimate updates. Um, now, let's take a little journey back. Um, let's take a journey back to um, episode 70 of this show, right? So episode 70 of this show, March 26th, earlier this year, we learned that the Coupon Bureau distributed 158 billion coupons in 2022, right? 158 billion coupons. Um, and a quick refresher for everybody, the Coupon Bureau is working on an industry-wide solution for coupon problems, and the new standard is 8112 to replace the old format, 8110. So this is a new industry standard that everyone in the industry uses, like convenience stores, grocery stores, gas stations, major retailers, e-commerce, right? Amazon, Walmart. Companies need standards for coupons so coupons can exist. And the crazy thing is all of the coupons that are out there right now, these physical coupons, all get sent to Mexico. They get counted. There's so much coupon fraud. And when brands, right, like if a major soda brand wanted to do a certain type of promotion where the coupon had some kind of mechanic, it would require all the retailers to do all this work. So 
you a brand can't do these campaigns that create these experiences for customers. But with this new standard 8112 that leverages Hedera, it kind of would be instant and built in. So basically, there has been pilots. This current standard is being used at like some mom and pop grocery stores and I think a small ice cream shop and also a hardware store and like some other smaller stores that are early adopters and kind of piloting this. Um, and basically, the challenge is there's so much that has to be done from the retailer side. And the retailer side is kind of dragging their heels, right? The brands, right? Like these major brands uh, that everyone knows, like Procter & Gamble, let's say, and all of their different products, like you guaranteed have multiple Procter & Gamble licensed products in your home. They're already partnering with this standard with the coupon bureau for this. They're going to be leveraging Hedera. Um, so what are the updates? Like what's new at this? Because we've been waiting for years and we've been waiting for things to go live and there's been delays. And I guess that's just the nature of enterprise, right? But what are the updates for coupons on Hedera? So Brandy, uh, who is kind of the head of the coupon bureau, um, stated, quote, the largest e-commerce provider and the largest retail store provider are both building out right now to be able to accept the 8112 standard. So who could that be, right? Well, the largest e-commerce provider is Amazon. So there's one. The largest retail store provider, that could be Walmart, that could be Target. So taking brand yet her words, right? Amazon and Walmart or Target are looking to integrate the new coupon standard that leverages Hedera Hashgraph. So that's bubbling under the surface. Also, um, they're in talks with Japan since January. Um, and for wide grocery store acceptance, they're putting it at um, uh, quarter one, 2024. So next year, quarter one is wide grocery store acceptance for the coupon standard. Um, quarter four this year, they're expecting convenience stores. And quarter three, 2023, which is right now, they're expecting a large drugstore chain. So that could be um, CVS, that could be Walgreens in the US, right? So they're saying this, you know, within the next 90 days, we could see headlines that this new coupon standard is being used at Walgreens or CVS, right? That Walgreens and CVS um, related transactions are being, you know, submitted to the Hedera mainnet. That's kind of crazy. So, and again, we've been given these timelines before and they've been pushed back countless times. So a part of me says, you know, I don't think this timeline really means that much, but it is a tangible update and it does kind of seem like maybe um, a, a log jam here or there has been removed. So we'll have to see. Honestly, we'll literally just have to see. Um, they're also in talks with India and the UK. Um, and there's questions from the community that I also shared. So user um, Common Bra on the Hedera subreddit says, will the Coupon Bureau be getting a grant from the HBAR Foundation? If so, how much? And do we know how many transactions uh, per coupon? So... It's been suggested that every coupon redeemed will equal three transactions, right? One for creating the coupon, one for redeeming it, and one for settling it. So if you're going to have, if, if you've had 158 billion coupons processed in 2022, multiply that by three. Is that how many transactions are going to be put on Hedera from this use case? I don't know. We'll have to see. I mean, there's been a decline in the coupon, you know, coupon usage in general in the industry, maybe due to the fact that there's so much fraud, maybe this use case will increase coupon usage. We'll find out. Um, this is an episode of mysteries, folks. Um, that we're, we're going deep on a lot of stuff. We're going a lot deeper on, on things than I usually do on the show. So appreciate everyone sticking with me. Um, this is a story about Atmaio. So as people know, Atmaio drives the most transactions on the Hedera network. If you look at the transaction counter, those you know, a thousand or two thousand transactions per second. Ninety-nine percent of those are from Avery Dennison through their Atma IO use case, and there was a kind of a really pivotal moment that was set to happen last week. 
up until, I mean, not to spoil it, but, you know, in continuing, um, the AppMyO use case has been running using HBAR provided by the HBAR Foundation. So effectively, Avery Dennison has been using Hedera kind of on that free trial basis for their AppMyO platform since the beginning. And again, most of the transactions are running through the AppMyO platform. So recently, just a few days ago, the, the, the HBAR that was provided by the HBAR Foundation to Avery Dennison for this use case had run out. So it was basically speculated that Avery Dennison would then have to go to the open market and purchase HBAR to keep their use case running. At the rate it's running, it would probably cost about $10,000 a day. They'd probably, probably purchase this HBAR over the counter. And it was expected to be kind of a pivotal moment for the network to have a use case of that size running at capacity funded by um, Avery Dennison, who is also on the governing council. Um, and it appears that the HBAR Foundation has distributed 26 million HBAR to Avery Dennison to continue funding their use case. So the free trial isn't over and this transition hasn't happened that the community speculated on, which caused a lot of disappointment. I literally, I think that there was a Reddit um, post to the Hedera subreddit called, you know, disappointing news, basically. And there's a few ways to look at this, right? And I mean, there's three, I think there's kind of like three um, elements to this, which are really important to keep in mind. Uh, and these are kind of the, the key points of discussion on this Reddit thread because this sparked a lot of conversation. Um, the first is there's a disappointment over delay. So um, the commenter expresses disappointment over the delay in AppMyO starting to purchase HBAR from the open market. Um, and I, I mean, people were hoping to see the impact of this development on the public perception of HBAR and its price dynamics. So basically, the community really excited to say, hey, listen, we've got um, an enterprise buying $10,000 worth of HBAR every day to fund a use case on this network. That would have been cool. The other thing is confidence in, in AppMyO. So despite the delay, um, you know, people in the community interpret the additional grant of HBAR as a sign of HBAR Foundation's confidence in AppMyO. So what that basically implies is like, did, AppMyO, did Avery Dennison, did AppMyO reach a milestone? Because we've heard um, from, you know, Shane at the HBAR Foundation that they only give grants to, um, you know, grantees that hit certain milestones. So were there other milestones that Avery Dennison hit that triggered um, this additional H bar to be distributed to them. That's a really interesting thing to wonder, right? Um, and it really kind of gets you thinking. So it may not be all bad. Um, and there's another thing, which is uh, the investment in some cost fallacy. So kind of like people acknowledging that the H bar foundation has invested significantly in at success, which could release to this, again, a sunk cost fallacy, which is kind of like, it will take off eventually. Let's just keep putting more and more money into it. Um, however, I think I side on the point of this, you know, being confidence in the AppMyO platform. And so here's the reality of this news is my thoughts are the transition and all of this stuff was basically pure speculation from the community. So, you know, make of it what you will. Um, and it is a fact that, you know, grant funding from the HBAR Foundation is only given when certain milestones are achieved. So according to the foundation, you can assume that very recently Avery Dennison has achieved a milestone. So I think the real question should be what milestone has Avery Dennison achieved with that MIO and what, you know, is going to change uh, because of that milestone being achieved. Also this $26 million H bar is just going to end up at the treasury. Again, there's no community nodes, right? All the nodes are governing council nodes. Um, and so this 26 million H bar it's just going to cycle back, right? Because it's going to that H bar is going to be used to pay for fees for this use case. It's not going to be used for, um, you know, developing infrastructure, or doing these types of things. This is a big company; they're just using this H bar to pay for fees. So all that H bar is going to end back at the treasury, anyways. 
10% of that is going to end in account 0.0.800, which is the rewards account, which that those millions of HBAR will end up in our wallets. Um, and that HBAR that ends up back at the governing council treasury will probably end up back at the HBAR foundation. So this isn't really a case of the HBAR foundation throwing, you know, 26 million HBAR out the window. Um, you know, sometimes use cases that they'll give grant funding to that H bar will be converted into fiat or it'll be used to pay for services or exit, right? The, the, the cycle, but because of Atma IO, this H bar is being used specifically for paying for transactions. So this is just going to cycle back through. So for me, honestly, I'm not super concerned about this. I have to admit, I was assuming that, um, Atma IO would transition to buying H bar and I was excited for that, but I mean, we don't have that transparency around these milestones for these use cases. I don't know if we're entitled to those, but again, surprise, but I'm not super worried just because of those different aspects. Right. So, um, I don't think it's, you know, there's no kind of alarm bells going off for me to be honest, uh, in, you know, in this respect, um, what else we got going on? Um, okay. So let's talk about this, this, uh, this, this really big news regarding MetaMask, Hedera, all that kind of stuff, buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. Whenever I put out a tweet with the word MetaMask, I get so many different um, spam bots and stuff. It's it's crazy. So basically, um, the JSON RPC um, and MetaMask are being um, leveraged to kind of expand the surface area of touch points for developers um, getting into Hedera. So the updates are designed to enhance. And actually, what I'll do is I'll actually just read um, this Twitter thread published by Hedera because they did a really great job of summarizing this news. And again, this is important even for non-developers to know because the surface area of how developers can kind of, or even just the general public can can access Hedera is important. So many people use MetaMask. So many people use existing wallets out there. Not everybody is going to go and open a hash pack, right? Some people would, they'd prefer to continue using their MetaMask. So by being able to do the things they need to do on Hedera inside of MetaMask and also in different dApps and stuff like that, that's going to be huge for adoption. So the tweets go as follows, quote, these updates are designed to enhance developer experience and prepare the Hedera ecosystem for wider interoperability and adoption across Web3. With these tools and imminent availability of MetaMask for retail users, we are making sure the Hedera ecosystem is ready to welcome a broader user base and adapt for the future. In preparation, the Hedera ecosystem will support JSON RPC enabled wallets and apps offering transfer of HBAR to and from OX accounts, right? So Ethereum accounts, updated token associations for greater usability, MetaMask connectivity, EVM tooling compatibility. While we foresee retail users further adopting native wallets such as Hashpack or Blade Wallet, MetaMask compatibility provides a fast, low-friction entry into the Hedera ecosystem for millions of Web3 users. Um, so that's basically it, right? Is can you use the Hedera network and get the things done that you need done by using MetaMask? That's what this is about. That's what it's going to unlock. Um, and that's really kind of the headline here. It's huge. Um, and you can check out that story in the mega thread pinned to the top of the spaces. Uh, folks, if you haven't already shared the spaces, we have a bit more to get through. Um, I'm going to talk about some uh, interesting debate and discussion um, that's happened in the ecosystem. We're rocking and rolling. It is Sunday night. Um, yeah, I'm going to see the Barbie movie on Monday. Um, I think I'm going to see Oppenheimer when I can. I'm in Ottawa. i got to find a 70 millimeter, a 70 millimeter IMAX screening of Oppenheimer somewhere around here. And I've been avoiding Twitter a lot because I don't want to get spoilers. So if I've been less active on Twitter, that's why I'm very serious about both these movies. Um, so I want to share some more big news. And I mean, this is a dense episode this week, but there's so much important news that affects Hedera directly, um, that involves Hedera directly, and that has wide ranging implications across the crypto ecosystem. And one of these is... Um, basically the house financial services and AG, um, committees pushing forward new bills for crypto. And this is with input from 
Dalmini that's the head uh, compliance for Hedera. Um, so that's massive. So Hedera has been at these hearings. I think literally Nilmini featured like they, she talked about Tune FM. She talked about Dovu at one of these committee hearings. And it's worth noting that the House Financial Services and AG Agricultural Committees, they regulate the CFTC. So people say, oh, Agricultural Committee, House Financial Services, like, what is this? Um, you know, is this farming or blah, blah. No, like these bodies regulate the CFTC. And the CFTC regulates the SEC. So it's important. And basically, this is what it's about, is there's some big movement that's happened, a big announcement. So the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act, I mean, what a title, <laughs> Jesus, also known as HR 4763, has been introduced by Glenn Thompson, Chairman of the House Committee on Agriculture, along with French Hill and Dusty Johnson, uh, Chairman of the Subcommittees on Digital Assets, Financial Technology and Inclusion, and Commodity Markets, Digital Markets, and Rural Development, respectively. Additional co-sponsors include reps, Tom Emmer, and Warren Davidson. The act is a, significant, if it's, it's a significant milestone for the efforts of the House Committees on Agriculture and Financial Services to establish a regulatory framework for digital assets. This framework aims to protect consumers and investors while fostering American leadership in the digital asset space. So the timing of this, again, is interesting. We were talking just recently about the Shanahan Bank stablecoin enabled remittance proof of concept test. Now we have this both happening days after the Ripple ruling against the SEC. So coincidence? Who knows? The act has been developed after extensive feedback from stakeholders, including Hedera and market participants, and it aims to close existing authority gaps in the regulation of digital assets. The act also seen as a response to the need for regulatory clarity in the digital asset space, which is currently muddled with regulatory uncertainty and a lack of authority. The act gives both the Community Futures Trading Commissions, right, the CFTC, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, a role in the regulation of digital assets. The act is seen as a crucial or seen as crucial for America's standing as a global leader in innovation and technology, blah, 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 blah. Basically, this is what's happening right now is we're continuing to see this quote unquote regulatory clarity that everyone's dying for in all corners. It does feel like things are turning, like crypto is being beaten bad with all these different, you know, there's like 14 assets being deemed securities by the SEC and the Ripple ruling, this, these bank remittances, something's happening. There's a change in temperature. The, the wind has changed directions. You know what I mean? Sorry, if I take a break here, I'm just sipping my coffee. I mean, we also talked about last week, BlackRock, right? With their Bitcoin spot ETF. That was also huge. Big things happening across the board. Um, and let's see what else we got going on. Are those all my notes? Those are all the big, big major stories, I think. Um, let's talk about, um, let's talk about some conversations happening in the community. So obviously it's a bear market. Obviously people are grumpy. Obviously people are, you know, their, their bags are down and we're wondering what's going on. We're having debates. We're pushing and pulling. And I've talked about on the show, the fact that there, it does feel like there's these two worlds, right? There's the community, the, the H bar, H barbarian kind of community world, right? That's us on here. And then also there's the other world, which is like Hedera, Swirls, the governing council, enterprises, these, these people that don't generally venture into um, the community world. And the community world doesn't venture or can't venture very often or at all into that other world. So it's these two worlds and they collide here and there. And my hope is that they get closer and closer as time goes on, because I think that when a bear market hits, it's going to be so important for the community and for the, the, the kind of Hedera world to be in lockstep as the bull market kind of comes in. And 
talking about Sivo, right? Parabolic H bar on Twitter. He puts out a tweet that says, quote, should H barbarians have access to a list of all H bar foundation grants, amounts, details, and progress? Cardano and many other blockchains do, which you can check out. Commitments or so, sorry, comment discussed below. So obviously overwhelmingly 86% voted yes. And there's lots of different discussions. And um, I'm not going to read everything ber- verbatim. There's a lot of debate and back and forth, sometimes getting a little heated between the community members and Shane, CEO of the HBAR Foundation. Now, a lot of people have been poking at these discussions, most, most prominently this tweet from Shane in response to um, someone in the Twitter thread basically asking that some of these KPIs, numbers, performance, information be shared with the community. Um, and Shane responds, quote, agree, it's not unreasonable to ask, but you didn't ask. You demanded. There's a difference. And, you know, Shane's been spicy on Twitter. I mean, guy's probably stressed out. I mean, he's doing a lot right now. I mean, it's clear the HBAR Foundation was behind the big news of arguably the last couple of weeks or months, which is, you know, the Shinhan Bank stablecoin remittance proof of concept test. Like that's the HBAR Foundation doing what they got to do. They're not hitting the marks everywhere, but they are doing a lot of stuff. And so we've seen Shane be spicy on Twitter before, you know, saying, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I I really appreciate that, you know, there's this conversation happening. And I mean, there's not a, there's not general agreement across the board, right? But the worlds are getting close together. And some people look at this and they go, oh my gosh, why is the CEO of the HBAR Foundation, you know, being so hot headed? He should be more professional. Other people are saying, why are these, you know, Hedera community members acting so entitled to information that they're not entitled to, right? They're holding what they consider a commodity, HBAR, and acting like they're holding a security. And you can make arguments on both sides. And, I, and, I, and I've approached it from both perspectives. I think that you need both sides because when you have these arguments and these debates, again, from, again, we're talking about conversations happening between prominent figures in the HBAR community and the CEO of the HBAR Foundation on the topic of transparency from the foundation. You get some spicy tweets. And I talked about one. I want to read it a little further because when you have these things happen, you get new information, you get new insights. When you push, you get new knowledge. And so the tweet goes on, quote, what does maximize network value mean to you exactly? Our goals as stated when we launched the foundation are grow awareness of the HBAR economy, accelerate access to the HBAR economy, increase commerce in the HBAR economy. Now, I will say those are very broad goals, but it's good to have a North Star. We currently measure the following, quote, coin market cap ranking, average TPS, total transactions, total revenue, total accounts, TVL, HTS tokens, smart contracts. So I'm not going to argue with those KPIs that they track. Um, that definitely seems in alignment with, I think, what a lot of folks in the community would track. There might be a couple of things you'd want to add to that. He also says that Elaine from the HBAR Foundation and himself, Shane, will be doing an interview at the HBAR Bowl covering these numbers in detail, including for the first time ever, how much we spent of our 5.35 billion HBAR to get these results. So it does sound like, you know, drum roll, um, there is new information coming and it's going to be very interesting. And, you know, we're going to find out how much H bar they've spent. Um, and it sounds like maybe we'll be surprised to find out, um, how much H bar they spent. That's what it sounds like to me, but I just wanted to bring this up because, um, this is good, right? The H bar foundation, if you're listening community, like I know on Twitter, There's going to be arguments. There's going to be debates. I don't agree with everything that's shared sometimes, but it matters. It's important. And I mean, 
it's great because it, it's not attacking each other. It's attacking ideas and debating. And the community has to remember and under, and, and, and continue to understand, right? That they're just not entitled to certain things and certain information, right? We are hoping that HBAR will be considered a commodity. So we can't act like we're holding a security. And I know there's promises and I know there's speculative appreciation. You just have to know where your convictions lie, right? And on the enterprise side, the HBAR Foundation side, it's like, guys, wake up. You've got to start getting more comfortable with the fact that as the network matures, this community is going to continually have more and more control over the direction of the network. You will have a DAO of community members join the governing council member to make decisions. You will start to see direct lines of communications from people in the ecosystem to members of the governing council. Um, so that's also the, the what's going on. And it's not going to be on your terms, right? That's the, that's the tricky thing about the Web3 ecosystem is ultimately as the community grows and gains more power, you're ultimately going to have to adapt to the community's timeline. And we're not going to know when that handoff happens, but it's clear, right? We are on the, the watch of, you know, this other world, right? The enterprise a Hedera HBAR foundation world. But as they get closer, as they collide, um, that's going to shift. That's going to change by design. Right. But I mean, it's a very interesting time. And I will say, Shout out to everyone giving Shane a hard time. Shout out to Shane giving everyone else a hard time. It's respectful. It's debate. It's, you know, sometimes it's goofy. There's meme material, but the byproduct is new information, new knowledge. Diamonds are formed under stress and pressure, folks. Um, and we got some other, uh, we got some other items. Let's just, let's just get through these other items here. Um, it's been a big, big week. Um, what else we got here? Oh, so, oh, we're out. I think I actually, oh yeah. So this is, this is kind of one of the last things I wanted to talk on, um, before I share a little bit of a breadcrumb, there was an article published, uh, that is titled Ethereum, all core developers consensus call number 13 write up. So there's like these, thought leaders sharing their opinions on Ethereum and essentially um, Ethereum overwhelmed by staking growth may limit new validators temporarily to give developers more time for alternative solutions if they take the recommendation of um, some of the, you know, thought shared in this write-up on galaxy.com. And, um, it, it really is top of mind now, scalability, as you start to see, like, again, the transformation from Twitter to X. We talked last week about Twitter gaining uh, money remains license, licenses, um, crypto potentially being integrated, all these different types of things. Will these networks actually scale, right? Will these blockchains actually scale in the way that they need to be scaled? And how does Hedera Hashgraph fit into the picture? Is there a moment for Hedera? Will we see more intense volatility in just the kind of core fundamentals of a lot of these networks um, as they kind of strain under the scale and growth of Web3. Um, we've got a little bit of a breadcrumb, well, and a little bit of pretty big breadcrumb, uh, and this was also surfaced by King Solomon, um, great Hedera community member, big in the XRP community, so right at the cross-section of so many different things. Um, the Hedera Governing Council member, London School of Economics, right, LSE, um, their innovation unit has helped incubate Alex Alexandria, quote, Alexandria, a project to commercialize the building of smart contracts for contract licensing on Hedera. Supporters include the BBC, right, the British Broadcasting Company. So I'll just read a quick excerpt from the project highlights. So, quote, Alexandria is a commercial a co commercialization project by the LSE professor Tom uh, Kirchmeier and Jeremy Grant. Um, Alexandria successfully obtained a grant of U.S. dollars of 3.25 million from the HBAR Foundation to pursue 
It's commercialization of building smart contracts for content, uh, sorry, content licensing on a blockchain platform provided by Hedera Networks. Alexandria is the first project at LSE to take advantage of this unique blockchain infrastructure, which has already attracted a number of prominent supporters, such as BBC, for its experimental project. So obviously this is related to intellectual property by the BBC for their content. So are we going to see Hedera leverage for content licensing for intellectual property of the BBC? Fascinating stuff. Really, really fascinating stuff. Shout out to King Solomon for digging that up. Um, and let's see if there's any breaking news that's happened while we've been chatting away here. Um, always try to do that just to make sure um, what's going on. Um, OpenAI, Google, and others pledge to watermark AI content for safety, the White House says. Um, from Reuters, um, that's a story that just... Uh, was published and yeah, I think that Hedera would be ideal for that. You know, um, taking those pieces of information, we've, we've heard many people like Mance and Lehman talk about how Hedera can be leveraged, um, for, you know, authentic authentication and provenance of information in the, in the world of AI. Um, so that's pretty big. So, you know, cool headline coming out of there. Um, so another week behind us, and another week ahead. Before I share my quick final thoughts for the week, a huge shout out to everyone listening live on Twitter Spaces right now. Another shout out to everyone listening to the recording on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And an extra shout out to supporters of the show. The contributions mean so much. Um, so again, title of the show was Competitive Differentiation. And that was a phrase kind of said by, again, Shane, the CEO of the HBAR Foundation, kind of a focal point of this episode. But that term kind of describes a lot of what's happening in the ecosystem. I'll say it again, right? The definition um, of this is competitive differentiation is how a company's product or service is distinct from what its competitors offer. And um, Shane and other, you know, Big wigs say that enterprises refer to Hedera as a competitive differentiator, and that's the reason why they want to remain secret, right? They want to remain under the radar. That's why we don't hear about it a lot. That's why there's a lack of transparency. And it feels to me, for better or for worse, that the lack of transparency that the community gets that it's starved for is due to the fact that these companies, it would be, it wouldn't be in their best interest for their competitors to find out that they're using Hedera Hashgraph. So to put it in another in another way, you could also say competitive differentiation. You could you could say that could be um, considered an unfair advantage, right? So to me, it it sounds like enterprises consider Hedera Hashgraph an unfair advantage. To their competitors and that's the reason they want to remain secret and so that kind of just quick little comment that shane said on that july 11th twitter spaces um with governing council member google lots of great uh key points shared on that so definitely go and listen to it i think it was actually hosted by hello future buzz i can't remember shout out to elizabeth but i actually got a nice card from elizabeth uh so Shout out, extra shout out to Elizabeth in the mail. Um, to me, that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now. It sounds like we're going to be getting some some major news and insights from the HBAR Foundation, how they've spent that 5.8 billion HBAR, how much of that they've spent. Um, we're starting to see major news drop about, you know, stablecoin remittance, proof of concepts from major banks. Um, billions of dollars of assets being tokenized on Hedera, $50 million worth of diamonds being tokenized on Hedera, the Ripple SEC case. Um, we were just talking about coupons going live potentially um, in Amazon and Walmart. So it's like all these different things are converging. And it really makes you wonder like how many of these major companies that consider Hedera Hashgraph a competitive differentiator, right? An unfair advantage and want to remain kind of secret, right? Under the radar. It's fascinating stuff to think about. 
Um, and that's basically what's on my mind right now, uh, going into this second half of the year. I mean, we're, we're off to, we're, we're, you know, 30 days into the second half of 2023 It's July 23rd. We're vibing. We're seeing what's going on. Hedera is still under six cents. Value on the network's gone up. The market cap has quadrupled. Um, and, and, you know, we've got DEXs, we've got NFT ecosystems, we've got DeFi, we've like stuff's completely different now than it was last bull run. It's completely different. So it's going to be very interesting. And with that, that's a wrap for Hashgraph Enthusiast News and Rivers episode 84, competitive differentiation broadcast live on Twitter spaces every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and made available on all major podcast platforms the following Monday. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show, you can send an HBAR donation to enthusiast.hbar using your Hedera wallet. The show's full Hedera address is in the podcast show notes, the YouTube description, and in the mega thread, pins the Jumbotron up there. Go check it out. Appreciate the support. Get all the info you need about the show at itsbrandond.com slash hbar. And I'll see you next Sunday. And as usual, for everyone listening live right now on Twitter Spaces, you'll see your little you know um, profile pictures. If you see someone that you know listening, Hit their profile picture, send them a DM right now, ask them what's new if you haven't talked with them in a while. I guarantee you they got something new going on. Everyone's busy. If you see someone you don't know, you already have something in common. You're both listening to the show right now. So again, if you see someone you don't know listening on Twitter spaces right now, hit their little profile picture, send them a DM, introduce yourself, ask them what's up. That's what all this is about. It's about staying connected. Make sure to follow the show, subscribe. Um, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that good stuff. Um, really appreciate you guys tuning in. And with that, hello future, goodbye past.